Well, once again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our study of the Gospel according to Luke. Today we're going to look at Luke chapter 11, and there are two primary areas of study here that we will focus upon. One is Jesus being asked by a disciple to teach us to pray, and then the other Jesus rebuke of the Pharisees. So let's turn to our text and see what Jesus says. In verse 1, it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Interestingly, we are not told which disciple asked this, but he appears very sincere in his attitude. Whoever he was, he must have observed Jesus praying and been impressed with the sincerity and the depth of his prayer, prayers. Jews had special invocations and thanksgivings and benedictions that were often memorized, spoken verbatim. John probably taught his disciples prayers, specific prayers, and probably John would have focused his prayers on fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies concerning God's kingdom and the Messiah coming to fulfill those prophecies. This is the only specific topic, however, that is teaching them to pray that is recorded in the Gospels on which a, a disciple asked Jesus to teach them. In other words, this is the only specific topic they asked him to teach them about, at least as it is recorded in the text. Now in Luke 11, beginning at verse 2, Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation. But deliver us from the evil one. Not only are these prayers, but these are, in some regards, guidelines to the life of the individual and the nature of his service to God. For example, in verse 4, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. You see, Jesus is encouraging them to have the right kind of living in their existence as they are disciples of his. This prayer is a prototype. It's teaching how to pray. The spirit of prayer and the kinds of things to include in prayer are given by Jesus. On whatever occasion anyone is praying, he should remember some of these things as he goes along in his prayer. We are to show reverence to God, obviously. Now that the kingdom prophecies have been fulfilled, we should pray that men receive God's rule in our lives, his kingdom, from a personal perspective. 
we should pray for physical blessings as the disciples are taught to here. And we should pray for forgiveness of our sins as we forgive others. And we should pray for help against Satan and temptation and evil in the lives of men and particularly in our own lives. The Lord's Prayer might be compared here in Luke 11 to a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. And you will notice from the chart that there are five requests in Luke and seven in Matthew. In Luke, however, it seems that when Jesus had said in Matthew, your will be done, that that's absorbed in what he says for them in the book of Luke, your kingdom come. And in Luke, it seems, deliver us from evil is included in the statement, lead us not into temptation. So in Luke, it is a shortened form of the prayer, somewhat, but all the ideas seem to still be there. This may or may not have been given on two different occasions. Certainly Jesus would want his disciples to pray and to pray properly and would talk to them about that over and over again during the three and a half or so years that they were with him. Well, let's move on a little bit. The theme is still prayer, and Jesus is still teaching them to pray properly. And he said to them, verse 5, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Well, this parable is also teaching how to pray. And the point he seems to be making here is that we should not lose heart when answer to prayer is delayed. Unlike the sleepy neighbor, God will respond, but it may require some patience The neighbor stands in contrast to God. God is our true friend, and he truly cares. And so don't take this parable, if you will, in such a way as to say that God is sleeping and putting us off and doesn't care. He does. Keep the focus of the parable in mind. And that is, once again, don't lose heart when answer to your prayer is delayed. Keep on praying persistently in your life. In verse 9, Jesus says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, 
and to him who knocks it will be opened. Again, we're still talking about prayer, and Jesus is still teaching these disciples to pray. It wasn't just in what we call the Lord's Prayer that Jesus was teaching them to pray. That, of course, tells us some of the things to pray for. But here are some of the attitudes and some of the concepts of prayer that we need to remember as we pray are taught. Here, Jesus wants us to know that God is approachable. He hears, he listens, and he gives. He's a giving God. So he says, ask and it will be given to you. He treats us as his children, wanting to give what we want wanting to open doors, especially spiritual doors, for us to achieve good goals and purposes in our lives. Of course, this promise is based on our having relationship with Him. He is our Father if we are following Him, if we've responded by faith to His appeals to our faithfulness. And our role is not to demand. We need to remember this now. It is not to presume on God's goodness or take God for granted. We approach with humility, asking God, not demanding of God, not presuming about his goodness, but asking God to act on our requests according to his will and his purposes. So Jesus is still teaching us how to pray. Continuing in verse 11, Jesus says, Now this, if a son asks for bread... Will any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who who ask him? Of course, what he seems to be saying here is God is not going to give us what is bad for us. God is not heartless. He is not unwise to give us what is harmful. So God is not going to give us bad things that will hurt us, especially that will hurt us in the spiritual realm and in our relationship with him. But notice God is not going to give us things that are bad for us, even if we pray for those things. God gives the Holy Spirit, the message and the work of the Spirit to guide us and to provide spiritual things for us. We are told by the Apostle Paul later when he writes to Timothy, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness giving us the Holy Spirit who reveals to us God's word and makes known his will, covers all the bases with regard to the spiritual things that God can give us. So God is not going to give us something that's bad for us. He's giving us instead the Holy Spirit who provides the things 
doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that are good for us and that will always take care of us. Well, let's move along in Luke 11 at verse 14. And we do now change the subject somewhat. Down to this point, we've been talking about prayer and how that Jesus responded when his disciple said, teach us to pray. Well, Jesus was casting out a demon, verse 14, and this demon was mute. He couldn't speak. So it was when the demon had gone out, remember Jesus cast out the demon, when the demon had gone out, that the mute, the possessed one, spoke and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Apparently, both the demon and the possessed man were mute prior to Jesus' healing in this situation. When the people saw that a man who had been mute while possessed, but spoke when the demon was cast out. Some accused Jesus of casting out the demons by the ruler of the demons. Beelzebub, in Old Testament times, was a Philistine god of filth, he was called. That's what his name really refers to a Philistine god of filth or a Syrian lord of dung. So the name was consistent as this god was recognized either among the Philistines or the Syrians. And this Dung or this filth refers to the filth of their idolatrous sacrifices, the filth of off coming off of their sacrifices. So Beelzebub was a, a, a terrible imagery for them to accuse Jesus of being a servant to. They were holding. Beelzebub up as a wicked, filthy, refuse kind of a person that Jesus was serving. Do you see the point that they were trying to make? And of course, Jesus will respond in this case. Look at verse 16. Others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. He's contrasting the demons to the true God. Beelzebub to the true God. Satan was Jesus' antagonist. It was absurd to say Jesus cast out demons by the devil. There must have been some Jews claiming to be exorcists. 
What empowered them, he asked. What, what about your sons casting out demons? Who empowered them? Are they empowered by Beelzebub? Jesus said, so I am not empowered by him. Jesus was empowered by God. And the miracles they saw established that he was empowered by God. Jesus goes on saying in verse 21, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Well, here is the underlying axiom and the general rule that Jesus needs to get into their minds. Jesus could not be working upon the power of the devil. God is stronger than the devil, and they would have to admit that. Again, Beelzebub was not with Jesus, and therefore he was against him. So Jesus could not be working with Beelzebub because that would have him divided against himself. Well, in verse 24, when an unclean spirit, Jesus says, goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Well, here Jesus turns to the dispossessed demon. The demon is searching for a place to inhabit. Jesus has cast him out. And where does he go? Well, finding no adequate place to go, he tries to return to the person that he formerly possessed. But he finds the person clean. So what does he do? He goes and gets other demons and comes back into that person. He will inhabit him again. What does that say? Well, perhaps many things, but among other things it says, if one does not keep clean, the demon or the demons may overtake him again. In our lives, we recognize sin in what we have been doing, in the former way that we have been living, and we repent and we come to the Lord. If we do not keep clean in our lives, sin will overtake us again. We can be lost after obeying the gospel and coming to Christ. God wants us to keep clean in our lives after we have repented and cast out those things that are evil. Well, let's move on a little bit now. In verse 27, much more could be said about these former verses if we had more time. But look at verse 27. It happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you, and the breast which nursed you. But he said, More than that, blessed are those 
who hear the word of God and keep it. Of course, it was Mary's womb that had born Jesus. It was Mary's breast that had nursed him as a baby. She was blessed in so many ways, but more blessed, of course, are those who hear the word of God and keep it. The idea of Mary's being blessed is not the key idea. The principal idea is be blessed because of your relationship to God, not because of my physical relationship, Jesus might say, to Mary or her relationship physically to me. In verse 29, the crowds were thickly gathered together. And Jesus began to say, This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, a miracle, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah, the prophet, calling attention back to Jonah and his prophecy and his miraculous activity associated with his ministry in olden times. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. And then he uses another illustration. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. So the queen of the south came to listen. The men of Nineveh did listen to God's prophet. And they came and repented. That's his message. So he continues in verse 33, No one when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who come in may see the light. Jesus appears to a bit, again be using an illustration he had used in the Sermon on the Mount, the lamp on the lampstand, not under a bushel. The lamp of the body is the eye. He says, that lets in the light. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. You're blind. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. Listen to God is what he's saying. Jesus is the light of the world. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Well, Jesus is, of course, admonishing his hearers to accept his enlightenment, his spiritual enlightenment. If they refused, they would be lost in darkness. If they do not hide the light, they themselves will be shining lights. The shining light will come from them. So Jesus is calling upon us all 
to show our willingness to serve him and be good examples to the world. If we do that, we'll stand in contrast to the Pharisees. And that's where we're moving next in our discussion. Well, before going back to the text, let's ask ourselves, who were these Pharisees? The text is going to deal with them, and we need to know something about them as we look at what Jesus has to say to them. The Pharisees were fathers of orthodoxy in Judaism. They were the conservatives that kept the traditions of Israel. According to Alfred Edersheim, a noted scholar and teacher on the life of Christ, writer about the life of Christ, there were about 6,000 members of the Pharisee group we would call them card-carrying Pharisees. There may have been many more that sympathized, of course, with some of the traditions and the teachings of the Pharisees. But there were about 6,000 that really identified themselves as such. Their primary objectives were twofold. First, to observe in the strictest manner and according to traditional law, all ordinances concerning Levitical purity, that is, keeping the law as it was taught in the Pentateuch, and then secondly, to be extremely punctilious in all religious duties. In other words, keep the law exactly, tithing, washing hands, those kinds of laws. The name Pharisee means separatist. They considered themselves to be separated from others who did not give such special attention to exactness in observing the law. The Pharisees are first mentioned in history about 135 B.C., at least within the next 20 years. They were successors of the Hasidim. Those were a group identified as the pious ones. And among other things, they involved themselves with political matters, resisting the Hellenization of their people, the Greek influence upon the society in which they lived. They resisted that in favor of Jewish traditionalism. The Pharisees were a closely organized society, all of the members of which considered each other to be neighbors. They had a word, habherim, for neighbors, and they considered themselves to be that. The Pharisees proceeded from the scribes and by nature were rigidly legalistic. There were Sadducean scribes, but yet almost all of the influential scribes belonged to the Pharisee party, and they were called men learned in the law. So we read often about the scribes and the Pharisees. Pharisaism simply represented Orthodox Judaism. Within the Pharisees, there were two well-known groups. One was called the School of Hillel. Hillel was a noted scholar and rabbi among them. His views were more liberal. The other was the School of Shammai. They were more conservative 
following Shammai, a conservative rabbi. To give you an example of the difference between them, during the Sermon on the Mount discourse in the book of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus could have been seen by these two groups of Pharisees as juxtapositioning these schools. It has been said, Jesus said, and that might be thought to be, according to the liberal school of Hillel, whoever puts away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. That's what Hillel might have said. But I say unto you, that is more according to the conservative school, whoever puts away his wife except for the cause of fornication causes her to commit adultery. You see the difference between what Jesus would say conservatively and what the school of Hillel, for example, might say about this teaching. Well, the Pharisees, before we go any further, were not all bad in all of their traits of character and faithfulness. Jesus is not going to condemn them for striving to do exactly what God wanted them to do. That in itself is a good thing. They were concerned with explicit obedience. That's a good thing. We need to be. They put great stress on divine providence in their lives. And we ought to do more of that than we do. They accepted reality in the spiritual realm. They believed in angels and spirit living on after death. They lived simply. They refused overindulgence in delicacies. Maybe we ought to be more careful about that. They held tradition and antiquity as admirable. They often overemphasized it, of course, and made laws based upon it that God didn't make. But they did value family and tradition and the past. They had a strong group fellowship. Again, they over, often overemphasized that and did not include others as they should. And you see that in some of the occasions where the Pharisees criticized Christ for being in the presence of sinners. They were liberal in their tithing. They avoided every unclean thing, which they should. And they were the most dedicated of worshipers, at least when they were not trying to worship to be seen of men. In the Talmudic writings of rabbis, there is the identification of seven orders of Pharisees. Quickly note, first is what is called in the Talmud, the writings of the rabbis, the shoulder Pharisee. He's the one who carries his religious duties, the commandments of God on his shoulder. That is, he does what he does ostentatiously. He does it for show. The second is called the stumbling Pharisee. He walks with exaggerated humility as he goes among the people. Again, he's making a display of his religion. 
The third is the bleeding Pharisee. This is almost humorous. He's the one who makes his blood to flow against walls, they said. For example, in anxiety to avoid looking upon a woman, he keeps his head down and he runs into the wall. The fourth order is called the mortarboard Pharisee. He advertises his holiness. He puts it on a billboard. He advertises his holiness as he goes through the streets. And he says he's doing this so no one should touch him that he might be defiled. A fifth is called the reckoning Pharisee. He constantly exclaims that he's a Pharisee. So everyone will know he has fulfilled every minute obligation of the law. The sixth order in the Talmud is the Pharisee from love, from the love of God. And in all but this one, there is the element of acting out your religion. This one doesn't seem to include that. This is the only order that in reality approaches a good spirit acceptable to God. There were good Pharisees who tried to keep their spirit right and do what is right. And I would think they would be among the Pharisees from love. All the others create a negative criticism of hypocrisy, don't they? And the seventh order was the Pharisee from fear. He didn't get the love of God in his heart. Not exactly like all the hypocritical Pharisees, but his relationship to God was one of trembling, awe, and reverence. And God wants more from us than fear. Of, co of course. Well, the Mosaic Law involved the tradition of the elders when it was interpreted by the Midrash rabbis. For example, they talked about refrain from work on the Sabbath. And, of course, Jesus Matthew 12, for example, was involved in their criticism. Refrain from work on the Sabbath was contained in the law, in the Ten Commandments, in fact. So the elders created traditions around that that would protect that law, they said. They said harvesting is work. Plucking a handful of grain is harvesting. Therefore, disciples were guilty of breaking the Sabbath when they were eating some grain plucked in the fields as they passed through, they said. Read that in Matthew chapter 12. Healing is a work a physician performs. It is duty, it's his labor, his work. Therefore, one cannot heal on the Sabbath, they said. You see the extremes they went to that Jesus had to deal with. Similarly, with regard to honoring parents, honor your father and your mother, the law of Moses said. The Jews said, money may be dedicated to God, which relieves a son from the responsibility of using that money to support one's parents in their old age. Matthew 15. Jesus criticized them for that view. And then vows among the Jews, very important, making vows and keeping vows in regard to one's integrity, with regard to his life. 
swearing in the name of the Lord to perform some act. A person must keep his vow. The Pharisees had developed a deceptive method of swearing. If one swore by the temple, the vow meant nothing. But if one swore by the gold in the temple, then one was obligated to keep his vow. Interesting, isn't it? Well, we don't have time to discuss those particular laws, but they just illustrate how the Pharisees had had gone beyond God's proclaimed will. It involved hypocrisy. In fact, that's what Jesus condemned the most of the Pharisees. The Pharisees taught about God, but they didn't really love God. They didn't enter the kingdom of heaven themselves, nor did they let others enter. They preached God, but they converted people to a dead religion that didn't really love God, thus making those converts twice as much sons of hell as they themselves were, Jesus said. And then they taught the law, but did not practice some of the most important parts of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness to God, They obeyed the minutia of the law, such as tithing spices, but not the real meat of the law. They exhibited themselves as righteous on account of being scrupulous keepers of the law, but they were in fact not righteous. Their mask of righteousness hid a secret inner world of ungodly thoughts and feelings. Jesus said they were full of wickedness. They were like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but full of dead men's bones. All of that in Matthew chapter 23. Let's go to our passage quickly. In verse 37 now, Luke 11, as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Priests were to wash their hands in the laver before offering the sacrifices. That was in the law, Exodus 30. So the Jews said all people were to wash their hands before eating lest they pass ritual uncleanness to food, which when eaten would render the whole body unclean. This was not a hygienic precaution. It was a ritual act of pouring water over the hands up to the wrists, according to Matthew chapter 15, verse 2. Well, the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. See how Jesus responds to explain what's going on in their minds and hearts? Foolish ones, he says, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? but rather give alms of such things as you have. Then indeed all things are clean to you. How can we be really clean? Make the inside clean. They presented an appearance of being clean. Self-restraint, not involved in carnal matters. That's what cleanness would be, yet they were dirty inside. They presented the appearance of being clean, but they were dirty. They seethed with hidden worldly desires, carnality. They were full of greed and self-indulgence. Let's not fall into that ourselves. So Jesus says, woe to you, Pharisees, For you tithe mint and rue 
and all manner of herbs, all these little things. But you pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done. You see, Jesus doesn't condemn being very careful in all, even the little things we think that God has commanded. These you ought to have done, Jesus says, but without leaving the others undone. Fasting on special occasions can be a sign of repentance. For sins a person sin more than once each week. The rabbis, the Pharisees, however, said a person should fast twice a week. And with regard to tithing, we give one-tenth of our income to the Lord. They tithed everything, even down to the garden herbs that we were reading about a moment ago. Jesus does not reprove them for that, but suggests that they give attention to even greater aspects of the law. Woe to you, Pharisees, Jesus begins, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. How pretentious that was. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. Well, then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. And Jesus said, Woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Hypocrites, woe unto you, scribes, lawyers, and Pharisees, hypocrites, you're hypocrites, Jesus said. Verse 47, Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who prophesied between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Abel, of course, appears early in Genesis. Zechariah is toward the end of their prophetic literature. Hypocrisy. They professed a high regard for the dead prophets of old and claimed that they would never have persecuted and murdered the prophets when in fact they were cut from the same cloth as the persecutors and the murderers. They too had murderous blood in their veins. And Jesus turns again to the lawyers. He says, Woe to you, lawyers, verse 52, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You see, the scribes were teachers of the law, but they had taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in, you hindered. Well, as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things. 
lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. The future would be dire with regard to these people. Jesus had condemned them for their hypocrisy, not for their doing God's word, but for their traditions that added to God's word and to the hypocrisy with which they lived. Well, that's our lesson for today. I hope that it's been helpful to you. And I hope as you study this chapter, you will gain much from your study. We'll look forward to another study next time when we look at the book of Luke, chapter 12. Have a blessed day.